Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, we realize that it is late in the day on the second day of the event. Uh, you guys have all been uh, jam-packed full of uh, really deep thoughts. And so we want to uh, want you to, to hang out for another couple of hours with us. Um, we're going to try and have a little bit of fun with this, uh, even though it is a very serious topic. Um, it's one that's that's very much worth thinking about and that needs our urgent attention. So uh, please, um, as we're talking, be thinking, because this is not a, a spectator presentation. Uh, you will all be expected to participate. Uh, that's what it means to be a part of Eye on the Cavalry. We got you in here with the free cookies, and then we suckered you into work. Um, so. Uh, I will hand it over to Carl. He'll run through uh, some of the background pieces, uh, and then we will keep going and transition into what can we do. Carl? Thanks, Bo. Oh, hang on. Let's just quickly adjust that. Thanks, Bo. Um, yeah, I, I think, as, as we've alluded to a little bit, it's a pretty heavy topic in some ways. But if there's something I want everyone here to take away, it's that hiding from critical infrastructure vulnerabilities and the fact that the current state of things is the current state of things is not a great idea. We all need to work together to figure out ways to fix problems. Part of that is being very forthright about where we are. And so today's talk is on a scenario set uh, of war and, and rumors of war or as we get close to potentially war. What does that mean for our critical infrastructure? So we're gonna lead off here and, uh, you know, because I like uh, memes and TV, um, what is war is, I think, it's something that's talked about a lot. And those two things, I think, are really funny because those are actually both uh, derived from Ulysses Grant. And, um, you know, war never changes. The, the nature of humanity is to occasionally have com combat and conflict and adversarial activity. And, you know, we need to face that down. So. If we stop and step back and say, well, what is war? That's probably where we need to start when we ask what the implications of war on domestic critical infrastructure would be. And this is something that I think when I look at it, you know, when I think of uh, the, the, the traditional Western view, it, it's, you know, the quotes here from von Clausewitz I think are pretty good. War is not merely a political act, but a real political instrument, a continuation of political intercourse a carrying out of the, uh, of the same by other means. And when you really look at this, what we've come to know as war in the Western world tends to be state actors, physical combat, militaries, you know, massed forces in areas where we try to avoid civilians and defend our battlefields. And it really becomes quite binary. Uh, you know, we're either at war or we're not at war. And our, our conduct of war is important. And there, you know, there, there are functions of war like the friction and fog of war. And there's this idea of, you know, von Clausewitz said, well, there's this idea of absolute or total war when both nations are trying to annihilate each other. That's generally not what happens. Generally what happens is, is you have a real war where there are objective sets and it's mediated by political consideration. So when we think of this idea, particularly, in, I think, in the Western world, we think of, you know, war or peace. And what we think about are the laws of war and the moral considerations and the ideas of you know, not getting civilians involved. But do our adversaries think about war that way? Uh, that's a really good question worth asking. And I'm going to sort of be cheeky and say, no. Um, in fact, wake up. It's time to realize that that's not the way that war works. And especially when we look at some of our adversaries, you know, not the people of China, but the state and the military and the organizational structure of China, for example, there is a very, very stark realization that I think people need to take away, which is that there is not that binary war, not war. There is a continuation. And it begs the question, which is uncomfortable to ask and to think about, but are we already at war? So if you step back and you look through the idea of warfare and you ask, how does China see war? There was a really interesting document published in 1999 by the PLA, by two colonels, called Unrestricted Warfare. And uh, you can see in the center, that's, that's the original publication cover. 
Uh, the translated version you can find in the internet archives is on the left. And there's a couple images from that. And I, I think what Unrestricted Warfare did is it highlighted the fact that there is a very different way of thinking about nation-state conflict that China in particular has. If you fast forward a little while later and you look at things like the Gerasimov Doctrine in Russia, there are other folks who are looking at the idea of war and saying this has changed. So really what this document highlighted and why I think we all need to take away is that it highlighted that the nature and purpose of war have changed and that there are no boundaries and there's a multi-domain approach. I think further to that, there are these ideas that there are no rules. There are no legal and ethical considerations as this document put forth for what war is. And when you think of war from you know, my perspective as th thinking about it as you know, militaries fighting and, and, and doing the right thing, quote unquote, only fighting other combatants, this is a, a complete change in viewpoint. So uh, if I look at the summary from the authors, they said the new, principle of, new principles of war are no longer using armed forces to compel the enemy to submit one's will, uh, but are rather using all means, including armed forces, non-armed force, military, non-military, lethal, non-lethal means to compel the enemy to accept one's own interests. So we're going to quickly just look at some of the fundamental tenets of unrestricted warfare. And this is one of the lovely images of the face of war published in uh, that 1999 Internet Archive translation. Um, but really what the authors were trying to say is that unrestricted warfare is about innovative thinking. It's about thinking about the objectives of war and all the possible ways you can achieve those objectives, not just with guns and bombs and militaries. And so, you know, if we, if we look at this and we break that down into, into what is proposed, there are a number of different approaches to that. And I'm going to quickly run through a couple of examples so that this maybe will connect a little bit. But if we look at the idea of political warfare, for example, we can look at Chinese behavior over the last, say, 20 years, and there's a couple good examples of trying to use political uh, instruments to shape international perceptions and policies. And I think that the example that I, I have here is the, the Confucius Institute. And that's something that was identified by the U.S. State Department as not really what it was purported to be at first, which was, hey, we're going to just help people learn the Chinese language. But it was also about some, I would say, tactful editing of certain events or certain ideas, the omission of others, to shape the dialogue in the direction that the, the Chinese party wanted it to go in. So, um, you know, the political warfare exists. There's a couple examples there that you can look up. I think the United Front Work Development is another interesting one. That's the diaspora of Chinese people around the world. And there's actually really good documented examples of the government of China encouraging their citizens to try to do things like influence international elections outside of their country to go in a different direction than they might otherwise. So these sort of things are how a state could project power without using their military, but using political considerations. Another domain uh, suggested in unrestricted warfare was economic war. And I think that's a really interesting one. That, that's the use of uh, trade practices and investment strategies and sanctions to exert geopolitical influence. So there's some really interesting examples. I don't know how many people have followed them here, but you know, if you're around uh, and, and remember, for example, uh, in, about 15 years ago, there was a situation where there were a bunch of Chinese dissidents who Norway suggested should get a Nobel Prize. Uh, that was quickly followed by China doing a bunch of things involving trade practice to then stop export of uh, Norwegian salmon to China and left rotting salmon in their docks at home in Norway and had a, a pretty big economic impact. And this can be seen again and again. The, the, the Scarborough Shoal dispute was with the Philippines, and there was a situation where things didn't go quite the way that China wanted, and the Philippines acted in a way that China did not, or the party of China, government of China did not agree with, and they, they sanctioned effectively uh, bananas. And the same sort of thing, billions of dollars of economic damage because the policy that another country was taking uh, they, they didn't like, and so they retaliated out of band with an economic activity. So I think uh, if I carry on, 
and Bo, I don't know if you have any thoughts on any of these, but please chime in as, as we go through. Um, you know, we have other examples, the use of legal instruments and legal institutions. And, and one of the really interesting things that has, has played out in the last decade is if you look at the islands in between the Philippines and China in the South China Sea, very, very close, if you look at that map on the bottom, to some other sovereign nations, China is exerting control and they're saying, hey, this is actually our territory. And it's interesting to see how that plays through because there's, there's situations where the normal international discourse and places like the, uh, you know, places we go to for international arbitration between two countries, China decided in 2016, based on a, on a ruling uh, of uh, an arbitration ruling that normally would have been binding, they decided actually that shouldn't apply. And so in that case, there's this use of international law and legal manipulation and arbitration to achieve strategic objectives. So this plays through in, in, in a number of different ways. And we can start to see that actually China is being very, very, I would say clever in the, the way they're using lots of different international instruments and lots of different methods and tactics to achieve political outcomes without actually having any military action. As we step forward, there's also things like psychological warfare, trying to impact the thinking of other nations, uh, you know, having disinformation and influence operations to try to get your way. The example I would give here is when we had Nancy Pelosi who went to visit Taiwan, you know, that was something China didn't want because they didn't want furthering of ties between two separate sovereign nations. And so what happened was in that case, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan and Ta you know, Taiwan was then on the receiving end of a set of what appears quite hostile, uh, you know, exercises involving moving militaries out into the sort of straits of Taiwan and surrounding area. So we can see that the, the psychological operations fit into this framework of unrestricted warfare. And as we start to step through, we get to the use of high technology and the advancing of one's technology. And there's, there's an interesting phenomenon where the original 1990 text talked about dealing with a technologically superior adversary. And in this case, the United States of America had some of the best technology in the world. And there was Titan Rain, if anyone remembers that campaign, where there was Chinese intellectual property theft of US F-35 information. And so we, we can see how that sort of taking of technology to further one's own technological growth was a facet and an aspect of warfare. Yeah, I've got a, uh, a funny anecdote. This may be apocryphal, but a friend of mine uh, told me about it. I, I thought it would be apt to share it here. So he works in the uh, telecommunications infrastructure uh, in mobile uh, carrier, for mobile carriers. And he said that they got some new equipment, this was like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when uh, a Chinese manufacturer was starting up. And he said they were trying it out, putting it through their paces, looking to see if it could compete with the uh, American and European manufacturers um, that were predominant in the market. And, uh, uh-oh. I don't know what's going to happen, but it can't be. An, an advanced persistent threat is going to happen. That, that, <laughs> so it's time for outrageous speaker request yet again. And uh, we have a request from Mr. Holmkus that... Uh, we provide him with a soapbox signed by Josh Corman. <laughs> Suitable for a display in the home. <laughs> Congratulations. Someday that will be worth almost nothing. <laughs> uh, that day is today. I want to get up in the soapbox, but I'm not sure uh, I, could, I could make it work. <laughs> The, soap uh, the soapbox is for display purposes only. <laughs> it is a gorgeous display. Besides LV, besides LV is not liable for any and all use of the soapbox. <laughs> Please consult your lawyer before any attempt to use it. So, talk to your doctor. See if soapbox is right for you. <laughs> so, uh, back to the story. My friend's comparing these, these telecom products. Uh, and they go to start to use... Uh, the new one that they just picked up from the Chinese manufacturer, they're like, oh man, all the commands are so similar, it's great. They start going through the, the command line interface, 
and they hit an issue. They found a bug and they're like, this, this bug is identical to one in the other manufacturers. Let's go look at the manual. And so they went to the manual to, to flip through that and still had the other manufacturer's name in the manual, <laughs> where it was incredibly clear that uh, the Chinese manufacturer had just ripped off everything and didn't even bother uh, to change the names in the manual. Um, so I think at this point, uh, probably everyone has heard a similar story like that uh, or has seen news reports or, or things like that along the lines of intellectual property theft, uh, as I think General Alexander called it, the, uh, the giant sucking sound of billions of dollars of intellectual property being siphoned off to China. I think there was actually a, uh, a review of that you know, by, by, by the government last year, two years ago, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that you could definitely attribute every year to being lost in intellectual property theft. So, you know, would make sense if you have somebody who's technologically superior, and even though through one ethical framework, it's not ethical to say, break into companies and steal things, uh, in another frame, if that's what's going to help you advance, that does make some sense. So technological warfare encompasses that. And I think this is where we get to the final point, which is what we, I framed as network warfare. Uh, and, and that was a term that was used some time ago. Again, you have to think back to the early days of the internet in the late 90s and early 2000s for this to make sense. But that was anything connected to a network. And we've come to call that more cyber now. Or perhaps, you know, uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to dig into that a little bit and we're going to cover off, uh, you know, what might happen if some of our network connected equipment and all of our infrastructure was subjected to network based warfare. And uh, with that, I'm going to just hearken back to, uh, and I really want to jump in the soapbox now. Um, <laughs> To the fact that every time we get in an airplane, uh, as you remember from Josh, if you were here for earlier sessions, you get the, the you get read the warning or the you know helpful message of in case of emergency or landing over water when you get in an airplane, it's maybe one in you know if you talk to people at MIT, one in seven point nine million your your odds of actually having an emergency over water, but every time you get in a plane, you go over that so that you're ready and prepared if it does happen. So what we're gonna go over here is a scenario, we're gonna talk about being ready and prepared and why that's important and what we can do about it. So to talk about this scenario, uh, I will quickly uh, sort of put up this slide and say we recently, as of I think April, had um, Somebody who knows something about warfare and about what's going on in the South China Sea because he's an admiral, tell us that uh, that we have probably until 2027, uh, and that the uh, all indications point to PLA being ready to meet the goal of invading Taiwan by 2027, uh, which is an uncomfortable thought, and. Actually, if we look at the RAND scorecards for the United States of America, where green is America has a major advantage, uh, red is where China has a major advantage, and if you look at the scorecard that RAND put together for the, a Taiwanese conflict and a Spratly Islands conflict, uh, we can see that we started off in the 90s and early 2000s with a lot of green, and we end up in 2017 with less green. And the 2024 version of this report that's classified, and I don't have access to, could probably ask that gentleman who came before, uh, that I'm willing to bet is probably less green based on some recent developments. And you know, I don't know if the, the people who've flown planes would tell us what the results of a paternity test of a J-20 were, but um, that looks awfully familiar to certain North American aircraft. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's Taiwan, and we're gonna have a look at this. Uh, 
Before we jump in here as a recap for Volt Typhoon, which was a different campaign than intellectual property theft and along the lines of unrestricted warfare, as you approach a near peer or peer adversary status as opposed to a technologically superior adversary, your tactics switch a little bit. And the idea of attacking another nation's critical infrastructure to gain advantage becomes more serious. And CISA told us, amongst others, that there's a high confidence that we have that Volt Typhoon actors are pre-positioning to uh, disrupt functions. And why would they do that? Well, one of the reasons they would do that is because they would, uh, they would do that to be able to have uh, the capability to have disruptive effects in the event of a military conflict or geopolitical tension. So with that, we worked on a geopolitical tension military scenario, which plays out starting sometime after midnight on December 23rd, 2026. And that's the point where uh, there's the initial breach activation and the pre-positioned malware across our multiple critical inter infrastructure sectors activates. So this is worth bearing in mind that when you're living off the land and you have access to credentials, you don't need a bunch of zero days or exploits if you have legitimate quote unquote or seemingly legitimate access and that's part of the problem with that campaign. So uh, what would happen? Great question. Any, any, any thoughts as before we jump in here? What's, what's the first thing that might happen? Depending on the mandate. Sorry, I think David's going to want us to have the mic out. I feel like you know, in the spirit of yesterday, this is going to be pretty quick to go to a Black Sky event if they have the right access. That power is, yes, one area we should be concerned about. Yep. Nothing, because we've addressed all these vulnerabilities. <laughs> I, uh, we're, yep, we're done here. We're good. Uh, that, that, you know what? That, that has us all doing an awful lot of good work in the next two years. I, li I like that approach. Um, okay, so... Any other takes? Well, yep. You're talking about doing this on the day before, like one of the busiest travel days of the year. So people are like, the federal agencies are going to be busy dealing with a pissed off populace rather than maybe paying more attention to things that are of higher urgency. Huh, what a, what a weird thing. That, that might be something that happens. Disrupt power to just cause mass panic. Yep, that seems like it's likely. I think you have to. Oh. I think you have to ask what their purpose is, because yeah, it's one of the most busiest days of the year. But what is their intent, and what are they in trying to do, and how does that impact our response, and so on and so forth? It's 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 very complicated. Everything's very complicated. <laughs> At, I absolutely agree that we, one, want to understand intent, and two, it will be complicated, and there will be a lot of things that don't initially seem like they happen. I, I think the doctrine is clear. That's seen as an act of war, but then there's the question of attribution. You need to be pretty, pretty sure if you want to take a kinetic response, which is the doctrine, I think. I, I'm interested in that one because I think what you're saying is if there was some sort of attack on our critical infrastructure, it would be perceived as an act of war. I thought so, yeah. Right. I also would have thought so. Um, but what happens if somebody attacks, say, a food processor like JBS? JBS? Something like that. I think there's a meat processor called that. Yeah. Actually, it's kind of hard to know when to declare war if you don't know exactly who did it. So there, there's a 
if it's clear for various definitions, which the lawyers get involved with, that might be the case and that might be an outcome. But at what point does that declaration happen? And don't forget that our adversaries have different framings of war than we do. They see things as continuous conflicts along a spectrum without thresholds and triggers and binary distinctions. Uh, so the statement is, I don't think the threshold is operationally useful. And I think the, the, carry on, please. So it's, it, you, you can say it just seems to be important, and you will respond, but you can do it, you don't insist that it's not going to be solved. Right, it's a, okay, so the point was, you, you can say it's an act of war, but it's a slippery slope. And, the, and this is one of the big problems that we have with a scenario like this, and sometimes even discussing a scenario like this, because if you look at what is an act of war, what maybe would have counted as an act of war 30, 40 years ago it is not quite an counting anymore. And we've had this sort of threshold of events which are kind of near what would have been considered an act of war. And it's kind of, you know, I kind of feel like maybe we should think of the frog that is in the pot of water that starts out cold and starts getting hotter. Um, couple more. Please, the back. Yeah, so because this is happening right before a major Western uh, holiday, there's going to be minimal response resources available across the all sectors, not just any one given, every sector. That's an excellent point. And part of the clue of intent in this scenario is when this happened. So yes, that's uh, you have discovered a clue. Um, unless we want to get it into Talon manuals and norms that haven't become treaties and things, we've already kind of met the, the de facto declaration of war from the Talon manuals, Estonia, that we've helped with, is any attack on designated critical infrastructure confirmed from a nation state could be considered an act of war, et cetera, et cetera. That threshold's already been tripped several, several times. Like not Petio was Russian <laughs> campaign, did a billion dollars of damage in one day to Merck a U.S. company on U.S. soil, no declaration yet. So Chris Painter of State Department used to remind us that uh, attribution is a political choice. And to your point about boiling the frog, we're having more and more uh, things. I'm not sure where you're going with your scenario. I'm, I'm participating as well. But um, a lot of folks don't think that a uh, superpower would declare war through these types of means, but would use them in hybrid conflict if a war was underway, use it as deterrent, or warning shot, or way to upset political support in the U.S. to be engaged in Taiwan, that kind of stuff, as opposed to going straight for the gold. I mean, when you said Talon, I, I just assumed you were going after CrowdStrike there, but I, it's refreshing to actually think of NATO stuff. Um, yes, but that excellent point, that we have a very difficult position now because this has become normal and we haven't declared war when things have happened in the past. So one more here and then we're gonna step forward. I just wanna know, when we get to this point, how wide of the win how wide is the window of acceptable things we've taken at this point? Because every day, as you said, we're boiling the water, we're widening what we find acceptable and what we've taken. So what at this point is unacceptable? That, yeah, this is a, an excellent point. What? And I, I don't I don't have answers to that. I mean, I hope that we're thinking about that. It, it's a really interesting question to ask, like where and how could we respond? And there are certain, you know, certain actions that you might have to respond to. But what is that? So one of the things that we don't uh, we don't talk about is our counter capabilities, you know, to quickly go and cause the same kind of impact downstream. Right. So is that a consideration that the threat that uh, would have before they try to test the water? So the, the comment was around, and, and sort of the question was around, uh, well, we also have capabilities. And I think this is one of the really interesting um, points uh, about uh, asymmetric warfare and around uh, unrestricted warfare, is that, you know, unlike traditional conflict where if we show up in a field with a bunch of uh, tanks 
and the other side doesn't have tanks, you're not going to win. It's like, well, if we have offensive capability, my point would be this. Just because we have offensive capability to cause them damage, that might act in some ways as a deterrent, but it still leaves our national critical infrastructure potentially in shambles, and it leaves us as the citizenry in a very uncomfortable position. So I, I do hear what you're saying. We do need to think of response, but at, you know, we come to a bunch of problems first. And last one with that gentleman there, and then we'll step forward. I mean, from a national response perspective, politically, the big question to be asked at the moment is, in the coming hours, days, weeks, or week, as an initial response, is anyone gonna die or get hurt? That's the first question that's gonna happen. Nobody's talking about response at the moment. Everyone's literally just talking about crisis and making sure that nothing really bad happens and what are the likelihood of that? Do we need a politician or a minister to go in front of the press, statements, stuff like that? The response options aren't anywhere close at the moment. That's a really interesting and good point. And I will say, right now, we're sometime after midnight. So this begs the question, what next? Um, so we step forward from midnight to two in the morning. And the first step of what happens is uh, our water supply. Our water supply gets compromised. Uh, or our water systems, I should say, because we learned from Dean that actually that's not one big thing. That's an awful lot of small things. And in this case, uh, you know, I found out from Dean that maybe this isn't 100% accurate. It's hard to actually cause contamination of the water, uh, despite what you might read online and in various publications. But what we did learn is that there are other methods like using water hammers that can cause destructive damage to our water system. So we're gonna say first thing that becomes clear at two in the morning is, uh, yeah, there being attacks against ICS systems in water and wastewater. And there have been overpressurization events which have caused destruction to some of our systems. And at this point, I would, I would do the phone a friend and I'm gonna ask Dean, I'm gonna pick on Dean, and say, what do you think would happen? Just, it, it's two in the morning, do you get a page? Do you get a phone call? What's the water sector's response here? I, first of all, this is not gonna be unified in any way. Right. Everybody, every locality is going to be fighting this on their own. They haven't turned the news on. This hasn't made it out to anybody yet. So everybody thinks they have an isolated problem. So there won't be any kind of reach out to anybody for anything. Um, it'll be days before that occurs. So each individual utility is going to be looking to figure out, you know, immediately they'll be jumping on. They don't have really forensics capabilities. All they're going to know is that they have a a main break somewhere they got to find that which will take many 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 hours there will likely be multiple main breaks <clears throat> um, that'll take days if not weeks to repair um, and so you know back to our cascading failures thing so you know those things are gonna be play havoc on there will no will no longer be fire hydrants so anything that occurs in an emergency situation is going to be a big problem. Um, but I, I think the, the big kind of the trend I, I saw everybody go to was we're immediately going to know that this is a nationwide problem. And, and that's not going to occur for days. And so each of these folks are going to be fighting individual problems until they finally realize, wait a minute. You know, again, one of the arguments, my fears in the talk that I had was there's no centralization of this information each of these utilities is gonna be fighting this problem all by themselves. So from the point that this happens at two in the morning, how long before anyone even knows? Um, yeah, that'll take hours, right? It'll be well into the next day before we even understand that we've got a water main break, where it's at. You know, all we know, the, the plant operator is the only one that's on staff. And a lot of those smaller utilities don't have those operators on staff. So they'll be getting alarms or calls to go in and figure out what's going on. All they know is they've got a low pressure event. Low pressure event immediately means boil orders. It's just an automatic. So the entire system will be under a boil order. Um, oh, no, sorry. sorry. So this is the first just thing that's responding. happened. Yeah. It's 2 a.m. The first thing that's yeah. happened is... So they're going to get a lot of that sort of stuff. Some concerned citizens are going to be um, in water main breaks. Generally, there's the potential for loss of life because, you know, a five-foot main 
breaking is a lot of water that shows up in somebody's basement or house or at the bottom of a of a of a road um and that can cause some very dangerous situations cars being swept away i don't know if anybody's ever seen some of that it's amazing <laughs> so we're at two in the morning the other so the other question is scope there's depending on how you want to call it there's 150,000 discrete not connected water systems so my question to you is how many well i think if we looked at what we were told about a extremely sophisticated threat actor group who had been making a concerted effort to get into lots of our infrastructure. We'd have to think of this as not being one or two systems, but many. And from what I'm hearing, at two in the morning, we're probably going to have, at this point, a few concerned citizens. There's a. And uh, oh, how many? Yeah, hang on. How many? do you need to hit before you lose trust in the other ones that have not been hit? Before you start to wonder, how many? Is this uh, 150,000? Is it 1,500? Is it 150? Is it two? And if you have a certain pattern of evidence, your brain will naturally fill in the rest. And so we'll have uncertainty around the rest of the supply and the suppliers. Uh, just a clarification question. So is this in one time zone or is it multiple time zones? So we've been going by Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so it's actually 11 o'clock on the Pacific Coast. Yep. Okay, and does this include non-US, uh, non non-continental -con US? We were so constraining to CONUS. Okay, great. So, so one, of the, one of the rules, we forgot to give you some of the rules before we start this, but one of the rules is um, Roll with the scenario. Don't fight the scenario. Got it. Uh, <laughs> this has been put together by amateurs who know a little bit, but like, we didn't quite go down to the street level uh, of which streets are affected and not affected. So you can ask some really, really insightful probing questions, and I am sure that uh, the executive function of our governments would be asking those exact types of questions. We won't have those answers for you in this. Just, you know, Take it on faith that this is uh, this is where we are, and you know, to Dean's point, we may not know the answers to those just yet. Sure, fair enough. I, the reason I ask is if you look at CrowdStrike, that the timing on that, the East Coast gave warning for West Coast, and so in this case, it's the opposite that the West Coast would still be up. It'd be 10 o'clock. It would be 9 o'clock when this happened. So you now have the alerting going out significantly faster just like we had happen in CrowdStrike, so we could start the mitigation process in an earlier phase. Thank you, that's a, a really good point. And it begs the question that we're, oh, Dean's got a, another way. Hold on, Dean, we're gonna, we're gonna step forward here because we, 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 gotta, we gotta move. Don't get obsessed about the details of this. Just yeah. roll with it. Hi, high level here, high level. So, uh, because also at 2 a.m., in addition to the water sector, uh, somebody earlier said the power, yep. Uh, the power also gets hit in this scenario, and um, uh, you know, localized blackouts start to happen. H how big, we're not exactly sure yet. Um, but we also then have malware activated to start uh, delaying recover effort, recovery efforts. So if we think of uh, you know, our, our bonus element here, as you might have heard yesterday about uh, a, a crowd striked situation on uh, renewable energy inverters, uh, yeah, at this point, uh, we also see a change and new upload or a mass upload, probably unknown at this point to everyone, uh, uh, of new firmware to those energy inverters. Doesn't do anything yet, but it's just worth considering. But there's definitely, at this point, we start to get multi, sort of cross-country localized blackouts. Um, so just stop and sort of think like of the people you know who work in energy utilities and water utilities having a very bad early, early morning, December 23rd. And b before we go into questions, comments, and everything else for this phase, we're going to step forward to, well, then we hit 3 o'clock. And at 3 o'clock, you know, because if we rewind to what our friends at CISA told us, if I, I recall, it's, it's communications, energy, transportation, and water, and wastewater that we know 
have been actively targeted by Volt Typhoon and we know are being prepped to have functional disruption. So at three o'clock, the telecommunications networks start to have problems and we start seeing major ISPs and mobile operators going down. In this case, we picked on the Soho routers that have been compromised as sort of reflecting things back. But I think as somebody who used to work in telecom, uh, some of that gear that had vulnerabilities, you know, the core routing functions of a telecommunications network, you would hope are extremely well defended and very, very robust and have no vulnerabilities whatsoever. And you would hope that somebody who's an authorized user and has legitimate credentials can't just turn things off. But some things start happening and, uh, you know, the emergency responses that we're having to water and power would probably be somewhat hampered if your internet and your mobile phone system started not working very well. There's a question over here. Yeah, I want to clarify that you have no phone system anymore in this case and you will lose many television channels as well. Yeah, you, so the, there's a clarification that you'd have no phone system. The way I view this is we're fragmented enough that that probably wouldn't happen, drop out, it wouldn't drop out all at once. Uh, I suspect what probably would happen is you'd have different operators having different outage problems and, uh, you know, there might be some targeted DDoS things that take out certain equipment, but you wouldn't see the distributed impact of that right away and it wouldn't be obvious that these things were all connected because it's three in the morning and most people are still sleeping. It's only really the emergency responders who are, well, maybe not getting the pages or messages from their systems anymore and hopefully, gosh, haven't gone back to sleep with a Christmas party hangover. Um, but uh, good point. So three in the morning, we see our telecommunication systems starting to be disrupted. Uh, and bad news, at three in the morning, our healthcare systems also start being targeted. And in this scenario, we have our hospital networks have malware and ransomware executed in them. And there's also uh, the possibility that medical devices where there's compromised products might also start causing problems. And um, the early targeting of healthcare systems in a scenario like this is designed to ensure that the hospitals are overwhelmed, which, uh, yeah, combined with what we saw from Christian yesterday is a little bit upsetting to think about. Uh, for those not at Christian's things yesterday or didn't watch our CyberMed Summit DC videos, we asked some emergency physicians and hospital administrators, how long can a hospital operate without water? So I don't even think this step would be required because many hospital functions drop off within a matter of hours, no surgeries, can't care for patients, can't do laboratories, can't have HVAC, uh, cooling, sanitation, et cetera. So this one's just insult to injury. I think the water alone would do the job. Well, that's an interesting point and you're right, but unfortunately it gets worse. Um, <laughs> because if we are looking at really a scenario where we're trying to examine what could happen based on the data we have, uh, it's pretty likely that the transportation system at some point would be hit. And uh, this, this can get really, really bad if you start thinking of compromise of logistics companies too. And if you start thinking of all the automated fleet systems, and let's just take like package delivery companies and things like that where couriers need to go out and things need to get moving in the early morning to make it somewhere and all of the food logistics companies who have trucks, if those were also targeted and either denied or if those systems were conversely told to send things out, uh, if you send everything out and then you brick the traffic lights, that's a lot worse than bricking the traffic lights when nothing is on the road. So uh, in this scenario, yeah, we see a transportation attack and we've got a, a mics in the light. Um. Hi, if I'm pointed to really mess things up, 
I'd wait till seven or eight where everyone is going through rough shower and just lock down the beltway, you know, parkways, whatever freeways are running through major cities. You're a hundred percent right. And I think this brings us to Bo's point. When we were constructing this scenario, we, we didn't, uh, you know, bunch of amateurs up here. We didn't uh, try to get this perfectly right as to exactly what could be done to maximize damage, but that that is an excellent point and it's a concerning point. Uh, one more over there. I think one of the things we're forgetting here is that we're three hours in. Nobody's talking. Dean said it'd take days for people to start talking to each other. We're not even sure that people have been activated and they're actually getting the right people in, on the systems trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, and so here we are looking at a scenario. We forget that f three hours into a, a, a one incident is nothing, right? Thank you. That, that's a really, really good perspective. And that is worth keeping in mind that, you know, all of our emergency dispatch systems are, are trying to cope with these emerging panics. And oh, no. <laughs> well, it turns out that the emergency services dispatch and the distribution systems for those are also hit. And I won't get into the fact that you could probably set up a bunch of robo dialers to automatically flood all the 911 centers in addition to that. And you could target traffic at all the IP systems and their known endpoints to slow anything else down beyond actually damaging those systems with malware. But uh, yeah, if you were trying to create a coordinated outage, you are only a few hours in. Most people aren't even realizing this yet. So uh, one question or comment here. So one thing that strikes me about this is that this scenario looks a lot different now than it would have three weeks ago. I'm wondering if because it is that, what, because it is that widespread, I'm almost wondering if the first people reacting to this would assume that it's some common software across all of that, it's another crowd strike and not even be thinking about it being a malicious thing precisely because it is that widespread. Oh, absolutely a fantastic point. And part of the, part of the really concerning thing about this scenario is it's gonna take a while to figure out what's going on. I don't know about all of you all, but I would still hopefully be in bed at four in the morning even if something emergency was happening because for the vast majority of people it wouldn't affect us until later. Uh, and, you know, as we step through further, and I think there's probably a, again, I'm picking the fact that I maybe know a little bit more about core telecom routing than most people. Um, but if you have years of dwell time and time to map systems, you're going to know exactly what to do. And that's one of the things about a campaign that started in 2021 with a five plus year time frame to execution uh, of a further attack. That, that's going to change how this works. So uh, coordination efforts, let's just say, are gonna be quite difficult at this point. Um, but fortunately, probably somewhere around 5 a.m. Eastern, we would start having some government response. And I suspect that somewhere about three hours into this, uh, and, and please don't shake your head like that, I want to believe, um, we would have a state of emergency declared and everyone would start trying to do something. But you have to remember in this scenario, no, this is the <laughs> same day next day. Uh, in this scenario, we're, we're hopeful that three hours in with a coordinated attack, even though your telecommunications system's down, your emergency communication systems are down, there is definitely still going to be some coordination and, and we're gonna have some defensive response and there are gonna be people in places like Cyber Command and CISA and a lot of defenders who are on the ball and totally with this three hours in. This is gonna happen uh, because we're gonna think about this. Um, so okay, so we made it through the dark part of the night and as we start into the morning, people start becoming aware of what's happened. Uh, the bad news is our adversary is also prepared for that and has prepared fantastic deep fake videos which are circulating any social media networks that can still be accessed on any mobile network that still works. 
Um, so uh, a common technique of ransomware actors when they don't have the effect that they desire by the time that they desire it is they start going to the media. So it might not be the National Security Council that wakes up and realizes that this is happening first. It might be a journalist who thinks they've got a scoop or 10 journalists that think they have scoops that start getting uh, information from adversaries either as ad posing as adversaries or who are posing as average citizens. And so somebody's gonna find out real quick when our adversary does want us to know these things. Questions in the back. We'll stop for just a few comments, questions, and carry, carry on here. Um, go ahead, please. Um, with the attribution, like with, with uh, if they contact the news directly, they could attribute it to somebody else or start sure. you know, creating a, a different narrative than what's happening. Right. That, that uh, seems very plausible. Um, so in addition to public awareness, hopefully at this point our government, because they've started their emergency response a few hours earlier, has an ability to communicate out. And they would start, actually you would think, uh, working internationally with our partners. And, and uh, you know, I, I did see some eyes around earlier. We had, we had four eyes somewhere earlier. Um, but if we did have a situation where something like this happened, you have to think there's going to be emergency communiques going out saying this is potentially a very disruptive intentional act please help and please try to de-escalate um the downside is if though that if, if our communications networks are mostly or partially owned uh there is the ability to gather intelligence on those diplomatic efforts and we won't necessarily step through all that would happen there but that, that's certainly possible. And as we carry on through the morning, you're gonna to start to see some restoration efforts begin. I mean, hopefully six hours in at nine in the morning, we're gonna have people who are going to start uh, or, or be actively working on restoration and IR teams are activated and people are doing things to try to fix the situation we're in across these sectors. And, um, and more importantly than the incident response teams, you have physicians who are being called in to deal with the reduced ability to deliver care through uh, computer systems. You have uh, water facilities that are maybe stepping up at that. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say maybe stepping up. You've got uh, electrical um, facilities that are, that are ramping up. You've got some of the transportation folks that are realizing They've got an issue. They don't know the size and scale of it yet. Telecommunications carriers. So people are going through the steps to restore uh, what we call, for shorthand, I'll just call them national critical functions. But these things that we need to do to deliver medical care, to uh, keep cars on the road flowing smoothly, uh, to ensure that we've got fresh water, wastewater, to ensure that we've got electricity. So these are the things that, that actually touch our lives those people are working at the same time the incident response people are working. And even they probably start earlier than the incident response people. You may not know that it's a cybersecurity incident until after you get through at least a bare minimum of root cause analysis. So Comment. I need to throw a small monkey wrench into the monkey wrench. Um, most, util most cities, um, in the US that are gonna have, it's the same IT guy for police, fire, hospitals, anything county or public owned is gonna be on the county or, or city network and that's a centralized resource. So there's not gonna be an army of people to show up to start troubleshooting stuff. I, so You're probably right, but we're gonna actually hope that you're, you're, you're wrong. And we're gonna say, uh, you know, we, we are going to carry on with restoration efforts and we're going to carry on with economic stabilization elements uh, because, you know, you can make this a lot worse if you really wanted to. And that doesn't necessarily have to be compromising the banks and financial infrastructure. It could just be uh, triggering algorithmic trading platforms. But we're, we're not going to go into that too deeply because we're focused on our critical infrastructure that we need at the lower levels of Maslow's needs. So I, I want you to sort of stop and say this has all happened from 2 a.m. until sort of 3, 4, 5 in the afternoon. 
our response teams might or might not be responding extremely efficiently. We have people out. It's been a really long day. People are having trouble getting places because the cars can't move through the traffic systems that don't work. We're having trouble dialing in to respond to things and organize and coordinate because our communications networks aren't working. And, um, you know, I, here's the question, like what is everyone working on at that point? Like if you're, the, if you're a part of an IR team or if you're trying to work on a response to this in one of these sectors, how stretched are you? And how good or maybe not is your decision making? I was going to say, at least the physical aspect of this sounds a lot like hurricane response. And that's at least reasonably well practiced. Right. In hurricane areas. So at, at a national level, and I know that there are some folks in here who work at that level, at this point, we're imagining, and you can pick apart the scenario if you wanted to, I'm sure, and say that this is wrong, but the scenario that, that Carl and I built uh, imagined that you had National Security Council um, working from really early in the morning. You had uh, executive leadership at the national, state, and local level uh, keyed up for this. They've been working local problems. You have members of Congress. You have business leaders trying to figure out what's going on with them. You have everybody focused on their uh, the issues that they have locally and or starting to realize that there is a nationwide uh, whole of society crisis unfolding before their eyes. They're trying to figure out what's gonna drop next. They're trying to get ahead of things. They're trying to understand what's happening. They're trying to uh, roll trucks to restore things. They're trying to control and contain the situation, not at a computery level, but at a human scale level. And that's where the top level decision makers, uh, again, at the, the national, federal, state levels, at the business levels, um, uh, they start to activate and, and spend a lot of cycles focused on this uh, emerging issue rather than some of the steady state issues, rather than some of the other things that they were working on. Anybody who's worked any kind of incident knows crisis pops up, you drop what you're doing, you run to the, where the ball is. Uh, and so that's where everybody is focused. Exactly that. Uh, it's an uncomfortable scenario. And we're in an uncomfortable position because everyone's tired at the end of this day and no one's making good decisions. And that's when the intent of that action becomes clear. Because in this scenario, while America's in chaos, that's when a Chinese invasion of Taiwan begins. And if you looked at that statement that that admiral made at the beginning about uh, China's preparing for an invasion scenario of Taiwan, if you were going to do that and you were sure that there would be an American military response, it would be a logical move to try to delay and degrade an American military response and a domestic disaster or a series of domestic disasters would definitely have some delayed degrading functional elements. And so consider, consider the media. What are they going to be focused on when this happens, when the invasion of Taiwan happens? Are they going to be focused on the domestic things where they can get, you know, B-roll of people panic buying things in the store shelves? When they can have the national leaders on TV saying, you know, I'm going to get to the bottom of this, we're going to fix this, we're going to get you gasoline back in your cars and water back in your homes. Um, or are they going to have, you know, B-roll footage of, of carriers in the Strait of Taiwan? Probably more the domestic thing. And if you think of 14 hours or 16 hours or 18 hours of communication networks being down, transportation networks being down while everyone's trying to get to a Christmas Eve somewhere while a bunch of your defenders are getting ready to go on haul. I don't know about everyone here, but when I observe things in that couple of days before the holiday break, often things aren't happening really, really quickly. Stuff slows down 
well, it's already slow. People are traveling. People are moving. Systems are not built for extra resilience at that time. In fact, they're often maxed. And so what would the response be? And, you know, if we step through, you know, what would happen in the following days and what would happen in the following weeks and why would China do this? What were, what were they trying to achieve? What did they need to achieve? And did they achieve that in this hypothetical scenario? I think we could look at it and say, if there was some sort of military action delaying and degrading a military response, it would actually be very effective to have domestic disasters in series with intersector dependencies affecting all of our normal operations. There's, we'll stop for a couple of questions, comments, and thoughts. Sorry, going back to the time zone question and also the, uh, the uh, impacts, all of our frontline forces are in other countries along Taiwan and those areas. They would not be affected by this in any way, shape, or form. All the radars are up, all of your carriers are deployed, you're going to have the advanced knowledge of ISR, all of that is in place. And if our military is at least a little competent, they're going to be looking at those ferries and other things that have been accumulated for this invasion. So I suspect that this would have zero impact on the ability for the first five to seven days to respond to any of this activity, even with distractions of, that may impact the longer term infrastructure questions that these types of attacks would impact. That, that's an interesting point. I have a slightly different point of view, which would be that um, a actually one of the most damaging things that would happen is our decision-making processes would be slowed down. If you have a situation like this happening domestically, there are a lot of people in places that deal with emergencies that are dealing with emergencies. And uh, I think, it, uh, interesting point, uh, I, you know, I think it's wor worth considering, but I, I would say there's also a possibility this might uh, might cause some decision-making problems. It would have some delays. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned B-roll earlier of like, you know, the National Guard in the streets of the U.S. Like we're, you know, the world's form of superpower, basically. What psychologically would this do to people in other countries who are just kind of watching this whole thing play out, even if they're not directly impacted by it? Uh, that's a really great question, and I, uh, I don't think it would be good. Uh, but I, I that will say we'll shelve that one for a little bit later. Uh, I think we saw a little bit of this by a, a far less competent a adversary in Russia and Ukraine, right? There, there was a t there was some attempt at, at cyber operations, and I think we talk about cyber capabilities in. Um, used against us, uh, we're talking about water and power and the remediation of those things um, would happen in the coming days and weeks. But I think, you know, as this drags out over time, it becomes less effective in the sense that China does this in, uh, I guess, with the intent of gaining um, hopefully in their view, complete control over Taiwan. Um, and if that's not accomplished in their time, in the time frame that it takes us to respond um, in the region, then it's ineffective. Because I think over, over time we've seen, um, you have a more capable adversary in Russia, you know, on paper, fighting a less capable adversary in Ukraine. Um, and with the support of others, that's it, it is kind of their plans have fallen fallen to pieces and so i think as time goes on in this scenario unless china is able to control all of taiwan and embargo that then it's not going to be effective in the coming weeks and months and that's a a really great point and i i do want to acknowledge that and i'll step back and say the reason we tried to put this scenario together was not just to explore the exact event of an invasion of Taiwan. Ho hopefully that will never happen. There can be peaceful ways of achieving means that don't require that. But I think the, the adage or, or the, 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 
I, ha I have a colleague who uh, is former military, and he, he said, one thing we know for sure is the next war is not going to be fought the same as the last war. And I think that if we look towards war type scenarios, and if we look at this idea of, uh, you know, the Gerasimov doctrine or unrestricted warfare as the idea of the concept of war no longer just being about bullets and tanks and carriers, but actually encompassing all possible activities. And if we think in China, there is a competition between two superpowers where they don't have that same view of war, not war. There's a range of activities that build up to this scenario that are quite concerning. And I, I think that, you know, if we if we do sort of look at that and say, you know, I, I'm it's an excellent point. I don't necessarily want to walk through the if this, then that with Taiwan. What I want us to think about is here and our domestic infrastructure here. And I was once told the best way to prevent war is to be prepared for it. And I think what we're trying to highlight here is that our domestic critical infrastructure is not ready for heightened levels of conflict, whether they go all that way or not. Uh, and I'll just sort of go for a couple more questions. Yeah, so really quickly, um, I love all the enthusiasm in the room. We're going to flip to a different type of questioning. And so after one or two more of these, uh, I want you to save your creative brain power and juices, your executive decision-making facility for the what do we do about this to prevent, prepare, uh, respond, and recover portion. So yes, go ahead. Just quickly, I think this is kind of a best case scenario for America because um, to have all this done to degrade our ability to help somebody else is much different than it being to prepare the battlefield for a kinetic attack on us, which is usually, I mean, any kinetic warfare is going to have that preparing the battlefield cyber component of it. And so for China or whoever to burn all that capability and equity without us eating one missile, I mean, you know, it, it's bad for Taiwan because we can't come to their aid, but it's, it's almost uh, couldn't have gone better for us. That's an excellent point. And, you know, again, not, not in the military, uh, you know, a bunch of amateurs who look at critical infrastructure and go, wow, whatever the event is, and that is definitely a worse scenario. Um, and, and it, you know, might not be China. There are other adversaries who do not love the United States quite as much as we might hope they would otherwise. Um, there are a range of scenarios where our infrastructure can be used in conflict. And it can be used to cause a variety of outcomes. And we're not ready for any of that, is I think the, the one of the takeaway pieces uh, that I, I want some people to at least think about. And there are things that we can do to make ourselves more resilient. And that's the next, you know, I think that's the next phase that we're going to jump into here pretty quickly is, well, what, what can we do? And what can we do here and what can we do now? What can we do in the next six months? What can we do in the next year? But we'll, we'll yeah. now that you have the preview, we'll tag off in a couple more questions. I wanted to just back up and challenge one of the assumptions here. Sure. If you were to go back and look at some of our documentations around emergency response plans for some of the things we suspected the USSR might do in a, an all-out conflict, it was always thought they would do small nuclear bombs in strategic locations and not set all of them off leaving some to stay behind to ransom the U.S. to make certain actions if they were making other actions in the world. And we have seen some indications come out of China, they might look at something similar in a cyber realm. So what happens when you don't lose everything and they have that power to leverage us to make certain actions? Yeah. That's a great point. I'm not, I'm not fighting this scenario here. Um, it's just very different than I had conceived how this could play out. And just as we shift to solutioning, I want us to think there's, a, there's an acronym that I can't find published in the federal government, but the, in the risk lexicon is the closest I found it. After 9-11 with DHS and then early CISA, they came up with four types of consequence effects and the acronym is HEMP. So there's a human consequence, which is like loss of life and or injuries. There's an economic 
consequence, which is what it does to confidence in markets and GDP and everything. There's a mission impact, which is our ability to continue doing what we have to do for society. And there's the P is the one that's always forgotten, which is the psychological consequences. And without the thought terminating cliche of 9-11, we had a couple planes hit a, a, some towers. The, the human toll was quantifiable. The economic toll was eventually quantifiable. The mission, et cetera. But the thing that hurt the country the most wasn't that everyone everywhere was hurt. It's that no one felt safe. It's that the long tail psychological consequences is enough. So I'm not saying I'm smarter or different. Just the scenario I've been contemplating and trying to see as we shift to the solution set is on an escalatory ladder. I think they've already had a success in letting us know if they wanted to shut some stuff down, they can shut some stuff down. So that's kind of like the deterrent of stay out of our business in Taiwan. If we didn't stay out, I could see the next rung could be something like a demonstration of force, not everywhere not concurrent, but just as a reminder, mess with us and we'll do a bit more of this. And then there's, you know, potentially south of tactical nukes and things like this, it could be more widespread. I think the, the deep concern I have is we don't think they're stupid enough to declare war by a preemptive strike, which is what this one was. But that even a demonstration of force could have the psychological effect that a 9-11 did. And since we are so prone, what is the long standing? I think that what that does to, pu to public support for the conflict is it's gone. So you don't have to do something that would absolutely necessitate a superpower retaliation. You could just do enough to humble us and scar us. And on that front, any of the responses we do, one of the reasons I am so bullish on trying to make sure we disconnect the things that we can afford to, and we prepare, and we have good contingency plans is, I think the psychological consequences are the most devastating consequences. And part of our response should be, how do we preserve and deserve the trust and safety of the public? That's a harder thing to do, but we don't even need all out doomsday scenarios to have long-standing psychological consequences. And the last thing I'll say is, so far, I've heard many, many happy things, not happy, encouraging things from the brain trust in this community the last two days. But the one thing that scares me the most is almost everybody takes it on the assumption that we'll repair in a couple days. And they haven't really been listening to Dean and others, which is with just-in-time manufacturing and no surplus and razor-thin margins, we don't have enough parts to fix all these cities' breaches. It'll be not, not days or weeks, but months or years. It'll be like the key bridge in Baltimore. So if we had enough healthy workers and enough parts and enough time to concurrently fix them all, I'd be shocked. So I really think we don't get to decide how widespread or what sequence at three in the morning or what day it is, but we do have a way to control what we can control, which is we can prepare the communities for the scenarios. We can reduce idiotic elective risk. We can try to have some non-cyber responses to weather a storm. And this is why I keep treating this more like a natural disaster or disaster science or FEMA type response, which is we may see bad things. They harm us less when we're, we know they're coming and we know what we can do about it. So I should shut up and let the scenario unfold. But I, I don't think we have to go as widespread to do serious psychological harm. And I think some of our focus collectively should be how do we make sure that we are obvious and available helpers to help and be helpful before and after some sort of disruption. Yeah, and especially uh, on the supply chains, if our number one uh, microprocessor part supplier is now off the table, even if China doesn't take Taiwan, we don't have silicon anymore. Sorry, what does that do to the supply chain? It degrades it even further, and it would be months and months of us trying to recover, which is why the political decision making would probably pause us before we got ourselves involved in an act of conflict, uh, which would um, possibly not let us get involved until after the uh, invasion was already complete. So you only need to delay it for maybe a few hours, maybe a couple of days. 
I, I think, you know, looking around the room, everyone now looks thoroughly demotivated and uh, upset. Uh, and I, I would just sort of say, one, we are going to look at a second scenario where it's not that catastrophic initial multi-sector attack. It's, you know, we're going to look at a different type of event, which is just a, a larger impact or a large enough impact, but not one that, you know, not one that would go all that way. Something that's a step closer to what we might consider an act of war. But if you, if you did look at that and you said, what would, what would somebody do if they were trying to cause disruption, if they didn't want necessarily to have attribution, or even this become obvious that this is part of that sort of scenario, I, I think that when we were talking about it, one of the things that could happen would be cyber attacks against water because of the interdependence between water and healthcare and the interdependence between water and other things. And there, there, this is where the rubber really hits the road because there are actually things that we can do about it. And we're, we're not in 2027 or late 2026 yet. We're, we're here and now, and we have a bunch of people who sat and listened to this for a really long time, and there are things that we can actually do. And I think the first thing, you know, part of the reason to agree to this talk was we said, we need to have it be okay to talk about this. Because sometimes it's really difficult to talk about a scenario that's not nice and not comfortable and would have a significant impact on our, our normal way of life. But if we don't talk about it, we can't think about how we should fix it. And if we don't think about how we can fix it, we're probably not going to auto-correct on its own. Uh, so this is a chance for us to ask the question, what can we do about this? How can we take steps to become more resilient? And that's what we're gonna transition into now, is I'm hoping to ask everyone here to start throwing out some ideas of what could we actually do to prevent these scenarios or to mitigate the damage? What could we do left and right of boom of an event, either a larger event or a smaller contained event against a particular sector? How can we increase observability, prevention? You know, what can we do to improve our technical response and to basically to preserve the continuity of our national critical functions? So, and when, we're, when you're thinking about these ideas, I know that we all live on computers and we think about computers a lot, but that's, Computers aren't the things that we need in our lives, the way that we need water, the way that we need air, the way that we need electricity, the way that we need medical care. Think about those human scale things. How do we ensure preservation of the continuity of those things? Computers are one way, but there are others. So, uh, and as people give suggestions, um, the moderators have asked that you give suggestions without commentary. So, so that more suggestions can be given. Given that uh, critical infrastructure is a federal over, I mean, it's a federal function, making sure that there are common minimum security standards for specific elements, like knowing your system better, understanding end to end what components your systems use, and ensuring that they stay up to date. Just minimize the initial vector as much as you can. Okay, so initializing initial or minimizing initial vectors, that's that's one thing. I'll just say because a lot of us in this room wear a lot of hats, I'm medical reserve corps, so when something like this happens, I disappear to the health department and I become unavailable. Right. So you would already be going off to help. What you know, and maybe a follow on is well what else could we do to help the medical corps in a situation like that? Okay. But um with uh water you know, having that slow roll for, for awareness. I kind of think too, understanding the classification of the incident and how to communicate that within the decentralized environment of the different water systems. Okay. I a couple suggestions. I'm a little bit biased because intel intelligence is my role, but uh, it, I strongly feel that intelligence is really the only proactive cyber um, 
discipline. So getting intelligence to these uh, groups, whether that's um, encouraging them to uh, join their local ISACs or their industry ISACs and um, getting more funding for those ISACs. And then the second thing, I live in a small enough community where I could probably be on a first name basis with um, the IT person at the um, at, at, at the water um, provider or at the electricity provider. So are being you, involved in that way. Are you? With the, what, am I? Yeah. Do I know them? Not not yet. <laughs> hey. Recently moved, so. You're assuming that there is an IT person at the water <laughs> provider. You're assuming that they can join an ISAC. You're assuming that there is uh, someone who can take the intelligence. And I think that those are, um, in most cases, in most critical infrastructure areas we looked at, those are unfounded assumptions. So I don't disagree with that, but I want us to, to start thinking about how we scale this down to organizations. If you're gonna have a computery thing, it's gotta be somebody, something that your next door neighbor who's never touched a computer can operate. It has to be that simple. So one of the things we can do also is help uh good faith security researchers and help the companies understand how to deal with them when they do disclose their vulnerability into some of their systems. Uh, there's a lot of them that just don't know how to deal with that. Uh, good faith disclosure is an important point. I think if I were to weigh in on that one, I, I would agree, but I think that maybe the horse is out of the barn there. Um, you know, we're at a point where we have a ticking clock to actually take action. And we, I think it's helpful to think of what we can control. And I'm going to say that, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is while that's important, I think we have to be thinking of uh, further outside suggestions. You know, the idea that, that Josh has put forth in the past of if you can't afford to protect it, disconnect it. Like we need to start thinking about things like that. Like if you can't, you know, absolutely, we need to help the security research community, but that will prevent things probably further down the road. If you can't patch your systems because you don't have an IT person, you probably aren't going to get to your vulnerabilities. But it, it is an important point, but that's probably a longer time horizon. To, to get things down to an everyone, very personal level, I would recommend that FEMA step up advertising ready dot gov that talks about how to prepare for natural or man-made disasters how to put together three to seven day emergency kit and basic things that everyone can do and further if you want to do messaging to the other side if you suspect that they're going to try to do something, you step up the advertisements to make sure that they know that you're ready to go. Right, showing that you're ready is fantastic. And, and this, I'm gonna just dwell on this point before we move on because to defend, we need defenders. And if I, you know, if I think of my own preparedness and what I can do, you know, if I, if I think of, hey, maybe I wouldn't have water or power for three, four, five, ten days, uh, you know, am I ready? Well, okay, I do have a box of life straws, so maybe I'm slightly further ahead, but we all need to be thinking about what we can do to be ready to help our families, our communities, our country. So I just, you know, I would say keep that in mind as we go through ideas, but Please, let's keep the ideas going. And going back to the airplane analogy, first put the mask on yourself before you help others. Yeah, if, if we have outages like this, we've got no electricity, you're gonna wake up in the morning, you're gonna go out your front door, and the, the only person you're gonna be able to talk to is your neighbor. So now is the time to get to know your neighbor, find out the skills that are in your neighborhood. You might have, you might just be three degrees uh, of removal from the emergency management coordinator in your community. And that will give you some some ability to to begin to prepare in a distributed way because we're talking about a distributed attack. We're going to have to have defense in every neighborhood. Civil defense, cyber civil defense, y'all. 
So we were talking about you probably should do bottom up things as 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 well as top down. And I'm European, so for me this feels much more comfortable than for you all, I think. But you need to regulate. You need to impose measures to force companies to take cybersecurity yeah. and uh, resiliency seriously. Yeah. It's disruptive to your company when the Cyber Resiliency Act or something like that lands and uh, determines that multiple product lines you have are critical infrastructure and need uh, to meet this list of standards, but it does add value. Uh, I would agree with you. I think if we look at this and we say we have two years to do something and given the track record of trying to get companies to be, you know, gosh, I kept thinking through series of events that now now we'll have new regulation. Now we'll make change. Well, nope, that's maybe we're past that. And maybe we actually need to think of what we all can actually do without relying on somebody else. I think probably one of the other great things that we could look at would be de-isolation of some of these issues. Can we rely on, you know, develop the help develop the infrastructure in Canada, Mexico, so that in the event of something of like this, our allies can come to our assistance because their systems are more verbose through our help. Yeah, and uh, my plan is I'm gonna go stay with Carl for a little while and thank <laughs> <laughs> uh, One thing I'm not hearing anything about is how it's paid for. So there's two components. One is how to address the risk mitigation because traditional mis risk mitigation approaches uh, go probability of effect and how much it's going to cost and that's how much money you have. We need to change that formula some way. The other one is how do we incentivize profit companies to do these things? So if we look at transformers in the United States, those former monopolies, which are now operating as independent for profit businesses are eliminating things like transformers uh, and things, assuming that they can have the open market to come in there and fill those at a cost effective way. So the, under, uh, the underlying key is understanding the cost model and promoting a profitable way to do all of these things. Good point, thank you. I, I would like to say that as this is, is playing out, I would like you know my friends and family maybe not to be vectors through which disinformation might spread. But honestly, I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how to keep myself maybe in the heat of the moment from becoming a vector myself. The, that's easy, the internet's down. <laughs> <laughs> so I come from the local government space and uh, at the municipality that I worked for a few years ago, we would actually drill community resilience workshops where we did a scenario very similar to this, not as a result of a cyber attack, but just for any reason, all systems go down. Where can you turn in the community? How can we as a city bolster those hubs uh, to support the citizens that would come to them. And then also crucially to the psychological aspect, if you already have this built in sense of readiness and community and preparedness, then it kind of tones down a lot of the fear and like, uh, like as it's muscle memory. So you don't feel as kind of jarred if you're drilled in responding to this. Yeah, you know, I think it, as you talk to your local communities, I mean, we don't necessarily have to talk about this exact scenario, which is uncomfortable. We can talk about, hey, you know, how about a product class fails a la CrowdStrike. There's lots of, unfortunately, there are lots of reasons that we could end up in a situation where our infrastructure is not operating the way in which we need to. And we sort of run down the line of, uh, you know, on, on a spectrum of, efficiency to resilience where one you have no spare parts at all and everything works perfectly to one you have a spare of everything and you can fail gracefully and repair and replace everything we maybe need to start having discussions about tuning where we are in that spectrum and that that the conversations we need to have and the the drills that we need to do probably aren't these ones this was the the, the point of this talk was to bring forth a probably worst case or near worst case or very uncomfortably bad scenario to examine what happens if hopefully that will never happen and if we work together to try to figure out ways of drilling and being ready 
we decrease the chances of it happening. I was going to bring up drilling. Like we teach our kids at grade school what to do in case of a fire, where your fire exits are, where to go. It reduces their panic. It builds muscle memory. And without spending lots of money on the cybers or waiting for federal regulation to patriculate for the next 15 years, we could do lightweight tabletop crisis simulations. And the heart of what Bo and Christian and I and Jeff did with Cyber Med Summit is we shattered assumptions with two hour exercises with no budget, no money, no, not a whole lot of planning. We just got people to figure out what would you do and make mistakes in a game instead of in real life. And on the same front, to your point that you were starting to get at, if we go to introduce ourselves during a live fire crisis with our Mohawk or, or our hacker t-shirts, especially after not showering for three days, it'll be like DEF CON every day. Um, that's not the time to make friends and build trust. So I think some of this is making sure we introduce ourselves and obviously we wanna equip you with some curriculum or talking points or well-vetted approach patterns, but each of you live in a community and you could be a local resource if you make yourself known, available. We could also become advertising for a lot of the free federal services and grants that no one taps into right now. So I think you got a lot of the raw materials. We have not done the communication and connection stuff that would either make it less likely this will hurt as much or more likely it'll still hurt, but we will be less panicked in our response and know where the helpers are. Thank you, that's excellent points. Um, there's probably, a, I mean, looking at the question, there's multiple layers to that. I mean, at a, in the UK, for example, we have local resilience forums, so LRFs, where it's sort of the local authorities, the police, the fire, everybody comes together if there's a, if there's a big incident and, and that's where everyone goes. So there's a local solution to this. I mean, a lot of people shouldn't be expecting big government to lean down to be able to help when it's at this scale. And the capacity and capabilities that you had yesterday are the capacity and capabilities you're starting with at the start of the incident. And there's a lot of people that will expect magic to happen and people to turn up to help where it, that just doesn't exist. The spares you had yesterday are the spares you have today um, in the middle of all of this. But I think it's also really important to, to work out why we're doing it. It's not just to recover services. It's this is about deterrence. If we nationally can maintain pain levels that our adversaries may look to impose on us, then that itself is a deterrence. I mean, in this scenario so far, there's only one nation that's actually suffered an armed attack, and that's Taiwan. So if you go to the Klaus Fitzian definition of war, it's, an, it's a use of force, typically because something was exploded and moved. But at the moment, that hasn't happened on the cyber piece of it. So really, even if we wanted to trigger something like NATO, we're at the sort of Article 4, are we at Article 5 stage? By definition, not quite yet. We haven't done attribution yet. So this is about giving the, the political headspace nationally by having the resilience to be able to cope before we have to do something that the pain level is such, we have to escalate. Um, so we've got to keep remembering why we're doing this. It's not just recovering services and saving lives. This is, this is a proper national challenge. Thank you. I feel like David's probably put in 100,000 steps in the last two days. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, excuse me if I come off pessimistic for a second, but I want to take the time to kind of analyze and step back the greater scenario. So based on my experience, I'm. Based on my experience, I'm 38 years old. I've been in the country since 1992. You know, I, I, I have a decent education, but this scenario, this checkmate scenario that I understand has taken China decades to get to this point, to get to this checkmate. With that said, to change or to basically solve this in two years, is to me almost nearly impossible because you would have to have a top-down approach. What we're talking about here are great solutions, but ultimately band-aids, little pocket solutions, because we know that the top is really, you know, the ones that trickle down a final solution, but we know that the top is only interested in one thing, the next term getting elected right so i think 
if we have a way to penetrate the top brass, the top political leaders within two years to make a complete dedicated solution to this scenario, maybe we have a, a hope. But pocket community solutions, I don't think might be able to get to where we want to in two years. I appreciate the comment. I would probably counter that and say, uh, by that rationale, we should do nothing. And I think that there are things that we can do to be ready. Yeah. And, and my experience actually isn't that. It's that there are a lot of services and government agencies. And a lot of the time, you know, CISA, for example, has a lot of things that can be done and a lot of people that don't know about that. And I think there is a push to be thinking about resilience. And there is a push to try to fix our infrastructure and to make these things happen. That, that is, you know, we heard earlier from somebody who was in the White House and there, there are things that are being done and we need, you know, we can help act as connective tissue to our communities to make sure that flows faster. So I, I actually am, am maybe more optimistic and bullish. I understand that perspective, but I think that there are a lot of people in the right places in government who actually really do care about this. I think there's a lot of people in our broader uh, defense community who really care about this. There's a lot of people who are tasked with critical infrastructure who care about this, but there's a disconnect sometimes between that and the people operating the local municipal water company or, you know, we need to prepare for resilience in all kinds of ways, not just for a scenario like this, but for a hurricane or for a extreme weather event that might hit. We can become more resilient and prepare for a wide range of things and benefit in all scenarios. So I, I, I would counter that and I would say, actually, I think there are a lot of people in the right places in government who do care. There are a lot of solutions that are being worked on and we can help bring that message to the people who need to hear it. We can help communicate and help build that resilience more quickly. We can act as an accelerant and get a lot done in two years if everyone works together. Yeah, I think uh, I understand your perspective and I, I understand how you came to it. Uh, I think it is right in that we will not prevent any bad thing from happening. It is impossible to prevent any bad thing from happening. So between there and there are no humans left alive in America, there's a, the spectrum and a gradient, and we can go more towards a better outcome than a worse outcome by acting, even if that means uh, we still have some impacts, we're still degraded, um, we can have a, a much better set of fixes in place uh, to prepare, prevent, uh, respond and recover uh, our society more quickly um, than we would otherwise. Because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to go down the the nihilism route. Just say like, well, time to move to Europe or you know, <laughs> do something else. Um, I, I think that there are things that can be done um, to address many of the things that would cause us long term permanent severe harm. Totally. So um, I'm going to take the opposite view, right? So to defend, we need defenders. We've got the defenders. We need to let them defend, right? We need to, you know, we need a massive streamlined grants program to fund them. We need to give all those, um, you know, cybersecurity graduates who can't find jobs because they need four years of experience to get an entry-level job. We need to put in place the roadmaps, you know, the mentors, to put the funding in to, you know, have mentors accompany them to these organizations that need the help. We need to have those organizations not be tied up with a whole bunch of grant writing to do that. I mean, heaven knows the number of fire departments I've had to help write grants, right? You know, we need to make it easy for the defenders who we have, who want to defend, to actually defend. And as a former teaching academic, the fact that, that the people who want to do this have so many roadblocks before they can actually do this, pisses me off. I'm sorry, <laughs> right? No, I... There's just, they want to do this, they have the skills, and everywhere they turn, they get kicked. Why? Change is hard. Now, I don't have a good answer to that, but 
I think part of the reason we're here is to look at what we can do. And, and that's a, a good point. There's lots of things that can be done. There's lots of things that we can do. Probably finding a way to, to let defenders defend is something that needs to be done. I meant this or we meant this in the context of what can you do? And if you don't do anything to prepare for an event of any variety, when that event hits, you don't want to be the one, you know, if, if, if I'm going to try to help when something happens, I need to be able to have water to drink, food to eat. I need to be prepared to be able to defend. So uh, I'm being subtly okay. told we'll, that we'll have about five, five, five minutes left um, to respond to your point. Uh, one of the things that we can do is maybe accelerate the national uh, program um, for getting more people in position. So if I were to go back and tweak this slide to defend, we need defenders in defensible positions. Yes. Yes, exactly. So what else do you want to talk about? I mean, do you want to wrap up? No, I'm happy to let you wrap up. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think this has been a productive session. Clearly, there's a lot of people with a lot of passion for this type of a topic. Um, there's a lot of good ideas that I heard uh, coming from all across the room, which was really nice. Uh, I think the, the thing that I would want to leave you with is, uh, first, even if you believe that this is an implausible scenario, one in 7.9 million odds, we prepare for uh, much less plausible scenarios every single day. Uh, we do, at hospitals, we do no tornado drills in places that don't get tornadoes. Uh, hurricane drills, places that don't get hurt. We do other drills, places where um, you won't see those types of disasters. We can also do those types of things for much more likely types of scenarios because whether it's a war or uh, friendly fire from a software vendor, these types of crises will happen. They will become more increasing as our dependence on connected technology continues to increase. Um, I think that it sounds like there's a lot of uh, excitement to do things. I heard several suggestions about get involved locally. Meet your neighbor, I think, is a great one. Um, meet other people uh, is also a great one. Go and talk to people about what you're passionate about. Um, I've had great experiences like finding random people. Uh, I recently moved, and there was a guy moving stuff into my house, uh, like from a big warehouse someplace. Um, and he came in and he saw a DEF CON. So he's like, oh. You went to DEF CON one time? Like, yeah, let me tell you about this. And like, we just sat there and talked for like 20 minutes about cybersecurity and about hacking. He's like, it's so cool, I love it. So people are really excited to engage about something that you're excited about. And also something as cool as what we get to do every single day, because it is kind of rad. So I think uh, like Josh, I think it was Josh who said yesterday, go out and stare at somebody else's shoes, or maybe that was sick codes. Um, I mean, Casey John Ellis. Uh, <laughs> So uh, getting out and, and meeting people and being prepared for things in that human way uh, is a good next step to take. Um, also continuing to be passionate about the things you're passionate about, to fight for getting more people employed uh, in good positions who are capable and have those uh, experiences and backgrounds. Uh, these are all going to be effective practices. Um, and to look at some of the programs that are standing up uh, you know, there have been several that stood up in the past few years. In addition to I Am the Cavalry, there are things like the CTI League, all volunteer programs. Uh, there are things like um, the uh, Civilian Cyber Corps. Uh, there are other uh, nonprofit and for-profit uh, and just pure volunteer opportunities to get engaged and get involved, uh, to get outside of uh, the work that you do maybe every single day and do it more broadly to serve your community. So that, those are my takeaways from this. Please join me in thanking these two fine people.